Thank you.
everyone. My name is Jennifer Nikolai, and I am the Associate Director of Stewardship and Special Events here at the San Diego Symphony. Thank you for joining us for our second episode of Lunch and Listen, a weekly series that we will be having for a few more weeks. We have a lot of musicians, so we'll continue for a little bit longer, and it gives us an opportunity to engage with you guys while we're apart from the hall. You just had the pleasure of listening to San Diego Symphony Orchestra's percussionist Aaron Douglas Dowry, and you will be able to hear another piece played by him at the end of this program. Momentarily, we will begin a live Q&A session where you will get to ask Aaron any questions you would like to know. At the bottom of your screen is a Q&A uh, box, and there you can enter any questions you have, whether it's about the many instruments he plays, how he's been staying creative during this time away from the hall, He's really looking forward to answering your questions, so feel free to start submitting those now. In addition, another way to engage during this program is in the chat box, and there you can provide any comments or thoughts that you have throughout the conversation today. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you have something wonderful for lunch, and it is my pleasure to introduce San Diego Symphony CEO, Martha Gilmer. Hi, Martha. Hello, Jen. How are you today? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. It's so exciting to have the second in our series. We had a wonderful time last week with Chris Smith. And welcome to all of you who I know are there, even though I can't see you. Um, but it is, I think this is a wonderful lunchtime program, and it just showcases the talent of our orchestra members, um, each individual uh, as each individual's talent, and then as they come together in the collective, which we can't wait until that happens again. So I want to bring on Aaron Dowry. Welcome, Aaron. There you are. Hello. Hi, it's good to see you. Good to see you. And that was such beautiful playing. Well, thank treated, you. Treated today to the works of Bach. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking that, of course, um, there, for marimba, they're all arrangements, of course, of Bach, who wrote these for original instruments. In this case, <laughs> the violin and, yes, and the lute? Yes. Um, Bach is something that uh, is kind of become standard repertoire for um, percussionists, uh, especially on marimba. Um, I, I personally feel like it translates really well. Um, it, you know, the marimba kind of has this almost Baroque um, sound to it like it's it's it can be a little bit dry but it's very clear um, there's a lot of ornamentation you can do and it comes out really really with a lot of clarity um, and we actually we don't necessarily read off of arrangements we actually just read off of the original music um, both for the lute and for the violin the range of the marimba is very close to the range of each of those instruments so uh, that's something that I mean our we have a lot of um, we have a lot of options when it comes to taking things from other instruments to then play on the marimba. Um, it's a very, a very versatile instrument to be used for that. Those beautiful chords, so perfectly balanced. Um, Thank you. And, and melody, even though it's a percussion instrument that doesn't sustain the sound, mm -hmm. um, your technique is beautiful in terms of how you connect each note to the next. Thank you. Um, that's the marimba is also a, a really wonderful instrument to work on uh, to work on our touch and our musicality and um, you know a lot of the a lot of times uh, in larger orchestral works where we don't have as much of a time to shine uh, and as much of a time to to be that expressive. Um, so it's nice to to use the marimba as a way to kind of really delve into some um some works that you know maybe aren't aren't meant for percussion but i think sound really good um especially on marimba uh and the other the other neat thing about uh playing the especially the violin sonatas on marimba is that we can uh we can kind of flesh out the chords a little bit more um like the violin only has four strings so it at most can only play four notes so uh, a couple times uh, in especially the first piece, you'll notice that I add a little bit more, just kind of fills up the space a little bit more. Um, it makes the chords feel a little bit more meaty. 
Uh, you don't get as many uh, resonant overtones on the marimba as you do on the violin. So anything we can do to help give a little bit more sound, uh, we will do. Uh, and we will, you know, um, kind of make, make these pieces our own. Well, beautifully done. Um, I remember the marimba, this marimba, the marimba at the hall, I should say, mm -hmm. is relatively new. And you and your colleagues um, made a great proposal to um, a group of funders that we needed new instruments. And yeah. beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were, um, we were very grateful to get that gift um, and to be able to spend it on some beautiful instruments. Um, I know my, the marimba I have at home that you saw me playing on is the same uh, brand as the one that we have at the hall. And, and I think um, both instruments sound really good. Uh, it'll be really nice to get a chance to, to get back into the hall and, and do some work there whenever we can. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's so nice that we have a place like that to kind of call our home uh and and to be able to to play in um kind of year in year out and that's um something i've really enjoyed um uh, being part of this group is is playing at that facility and and also um you know once the shell's built i think that'll be another really wonderful place to play but um yeah we we were able to get some new instruments uh in the past I think it might have been two years ago. Two years ago, um, yep. yeah. Right, right around when we did the percussion festival in January. It's about time, um, which was a really, really excellent experience for the whole, all of them, the percussion section at the symphony, um, to really get a chance to, well, to be at the front of the stage for once, uh, which feels very different, um, and also to kind of to show off some of our new instruments and, and to to share some music that isn't often played and, and not a lot of people know about. And we also, you went to the border to do the John Adams, Luther Adams piece. Yeah. Um, it was a great experience and great day. Yeah, that was, um, I personally had never been to the border wall before. I had never seen it in person. So that was just getting a chance to be there was, was really fascinating. Um, but that, that experience was really, um, really unique and and not something that i think you'd you'd find in a lot of other cities a chance to do something quite like that um and that was actually something that uh we we threw around as it was it would be something we could do now would be to go to the border and and, and all spread out and play that piece <laughs> again uh, yes we could certainly socially distance there yeah but there were more than 60 percussionists on either side at friendship park either side of the, of the um, fat border wall. And mm -hmm. it was profound. And you and your colleagues, that was a great, that festival really showcased because you have so many instruments and to master and toys to perfect. I mean, I think you have to be extremely well organized as a percussionist know where everything is placed. And I know your <laughs> studio at home reflects yeah. that. Yes. Um, you know, I have a number of instruments in my own home. I have a, a marimba and a xylophone and a glockenspiel and a lot of the instruments that, uh, that we have at the hall also. Um, and yeah, and it's, we have the number of instruments we actually have at the hall is, is, um, more than I have been able to count. Um, and, and numerous trunks and mallet instruments and snare drums and cymbals and, there's a lot of there's a lot of things to learn and a lot of things to I guess perfect as it were and and it seems like every year there's there's a new instrument that we have to figure out how to play. I know this past um, October uh, we played that Mason Bates piece and right. our our principal percussionist Greg had to learn the whole setup of car parts um, and that's honestly one of the things I like best about being a percussionist is that every week. Um, for the most part, I get to play a different instrument. And there are weeks where I may get to play something I've never played before or learn an instrument that I've never learned before or, you know, in the case of that piece, get a muffler from a car and figure out how to make the best sound I can from that muffler. Um, and that just, it, it gives me so much um, variety and so much just 
kind of adventure in, in what I get to do week in, week out. So many people are asking questions and you've answered mm -hmm. already many of them, but how, you know, you said Greg got to play the card cards, but how is it determined what you play and what combinations you play is. Um, so a lot of, a lot of pieces in the standard repertoire um, will have kind of a way that they're done. So if we do a Shostakovich symphony, there's a way to divvy up the parts that kind of every orchestra has done for years. Um, and there's actually a whole book with those um, fleshed out uh, that we can use as a reference to see like, well, how do we, how's the best way to divide the parts? Uh, and then really it's up to Greg to decide is what part um, as principal percussionist that's Kind of one of the one of the roles that that he um, fills in our orchestras, in addition to um, you know playing the percussion parts and, and doing all that. He there is a like a certain amount of clerical work that he does in terms of figuring out what pieces we're playing and and then using a reference book or or sometimes when we get a new piece, he has to go through and figure out what the best kind of setup is to have who play what and and that can get very challenging when each of us have many different instruments to play and we have to figure out how to set them up on the stage um but uh usually we don't make greg do it by himself it's uh we we try to be a little bit more collaborative about it and 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 some of these are um when you get a piece with you know three parts and each part has a lot of different instruments it's almost like a puzzle to, to look at the piece of music and, and, and envision how it's going to look on the stage um, and then, you know, get there on the first rehearsal and set everything up and, and do your best to, to get everything in the right place and, and kind of figure out where everything should go. So um, it's, uh, it's a lot of it comes from Greg, but we do, we do try to, to make it as clever as possible. Well, also music, I mean, instruments also from around the world. I remember the Takamitsu you referred to a couple of years mm -hmm. ago, um, when all the bells in that one, too. Yeah. Wind yeah. yeah. So we had, um, we had a, a, a number of instruments that were, um, that came from other countries. Um, I remember each of us had these bamboo, these pieces of bamboo that were called anklung, that kind of, um, the bamboo is cut to be a certain pitch and you shake it and it almost sounds like a bamboo wind chime uh, on a certain note. Uh, and then we also had those long um, giant wind chimes hung, strung up in the hall, um, which was a really incredible project to, to watch happen. Uh, and the crew put a lot of hard work into figuring out how that was gonna work. And, and they were connected with these beautiful long ribbons that when you would pull on the ribbons, you'd get this nice, just, like ethereal wind chime effect um, and especially in in a building that that big it really filled up a lot of space um, and that piece was really all about you know making space for each different instrument and 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 kind of letting smaller groups of instruments and sounds really fill up the space um, and that was that was probably one of the one of the coolest things i've done um, since I've been here in San Diego. It's a piece called, from Toro Takamitsu called, From Me Flows What You Call Time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, it was, it's something we should repeat. It was so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. Is, there, is there an instrument in the, that you play that you feel a particular affinity to or that you're always satisfied? I mean, is it marimba or is it, snare drum or is it i mean um it, it? yeah that's a good question um it i think i i i personally enjoy playing snare drum a lot um and there's a lot of there's a fair amount of solo repertoire for snare drum that uh, that i learned through college and i actually did a couple of competitions um, and won a couple couple competitions i did I, your bio. I, won, uh, mm -hmm. I won the international snare drum competition in italy um a number of years ago now and um and when i get to play it in the orchestra it's always um i don't know it feels like a very powerful instrument to me it's very like it's always heard um it's uh it's always a solo uh, which is nice nobody else is playing the snare drum when you're playing the snare drum usually <laughs> um 
And I do, uh, in terms of like solo things, I, I really, really enjoy playing the marimba. I just think it's so versatile and, and really the epitome of what we can create musically. Um, and there's, there's a lot of really interesting uh, modern solo repertoire for the marimba um, that I haven't played in a while, but I definitely, when I was in college, learned a lot of um, really interesting solos. Um, but I honestly, one of my favorite things is, is when I get to play drum set with the orchestra. That's, um, I, like when I was a kid, that was kind of the first thing I learned was, was to play drum set and, and getting a chance to do like some of the pops concerts that we do and, and to have played with some of the artists that we've played with uh, on drum set was actually, has been a really, really cool experience for me. Um, I remember, especially when we did um, La La Land a couple of years ago, I had, I had a blast playing that movie. Um, you know, it was all jazz and, and stuff that I um, kind of grew up playing and, and was, I guess, before I played classical music was kind of like my first love of percussion was playing drum sets. So. so when you were playing drum set as a kid, did you imagine you were going to be a percussionist in an orchestra one day? Uh, no, never when I was that, um, that young, because uh, I, I started playing drum set when I was like four or five. Mm -hmm. um, and at that age, I, Fantasia was my favorite movie. Um, but I, I don't know, I never, it never occurred to me that that could be a thing that I could do. Um, and kind of gradually as I, as I got older, um, and I, I grew up in Buffalo, New York. So I studied with the uh, principal percussionist in, of the Buffalo Philharmonic. Um, and kind of studying through him, I, I was able to see what like that job is like and, and kind of understand, oh, there's this whole like world of music that I didn't really know I had access to um, quite this way. Um, and uh, really going to to college um, when I went to Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh uh, and studying percussion there that was when I really kind of made up my mind it was like okay I think I think this is what I want to do I think I can do it um, but when I was a kid I, I, I really had no idea um, you know I thought playing in a rock band would be fun um, you know I liked watching the high school marching band I thought that would be really cool uh, but then the older you get you realize that um, those are like the career path for those are very different. Um, and I was really, I, the more I got into classical music, the more I was excited about it. And I think um, especially uh, I had a really amazing experience watching bu the Buffalo Philharmonic play Shostakovich 11. Um, and that was the first moment where I was like, okay, like I really like, like this is, this is really cool and really powerful classical music that, that I want to do. So uh, actually when we played it back in January, it was the, the first chance I ever got to play it. So that was like the fulfillment of a, of a lifetime for me, or you well, know, career-wise. So the next question is what pieces particularly mean a lot, but Shostakovich 11, speaking of snare drum and Shostakovich. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, that was the first symphony that I really latched onto is like, one of my favorite works. Um, I've always loved that. Um, Pines of Rome is another one of my favorites. Um, I mean, really anything by Shostakovich, I would say he's my favorite composer. Um, I think the way he writes for percussion is really, really well, well done. Um, and I think there's, there's so much emotion and power and like, I've, I've actually read a couple books on Shostakovich too and, and, and on his life and what he was dealing with um, both during World War II and during the Cold War. And I think kind of learning about the way he was living and, and what he was experiencing in his life and then playing some of these pieces that he wrote during those times really adds a level of understanding to um, the moment he puts in his music. So what's the range of... Um, of percussion um, that he uses? I mean, what are the instruments that particularly stand out? Um, well, snare drum for one. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of his symphonies use snare drum as kind of like a power instrument and like a really um, kind of to represent the military. Um, and he writes some really good xylophone parts and like cymbals and bass drum. 
And then he adds just like a little bit of, um, a little bit of extra in some of his, his pieces, like in Shostakovich 11, there's the steel plates at the end or like the bass chimes. Um, and uh, in Shostakovich 15, which I have not played actually, but I know the orchestra here did it just before I started. There's a nice little like castanet kind of woodblock snare drum part that's like supposed to em uh, emulate a clock. Um, and it does like, I just, I think his, his writing is very creative and it's very, um, everything has such a purpose. Like all the, all the notes he writes for percussion has such purpose and, and meaning. Um, and that, that is something I'm drawn to. So. Shostakovich four, I think also has that woodblock pattern. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yeah. He, he brings back some common themes with his percussion parts too. Yeah. A lot of the snare drum parts uh, can be very similar symphony to symphony. But, um, but I think and the way he, he uses them is very good. I mean, the cellist obviously <coughs> is a keyboard, doesn't, isn't played by the percussion department, but is a percussive right. instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, cellist and piano. Um, and he does write for his xylophone and glockenspiel, often kind of at the same time, those yeah. instruments are used together. Combines those. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Absolutely. Are you the first music musician in your family or are there others? Um, I am the first um, professional orchestra musician in my family. My grandmother taught like music at a high school um, and my mom played piano and my dad um, actually plays classical guitar in, a, in like an amateur quartet. Um, but I was the first, um, first one in my family to really like go to music school and and pursue that as my career path and, and kind of as my, what I wanted my life to be. So um, I think music was always around in my family. I was never um, not exposed to it. I mean, to all forms, to jazz, to, I mean, classic rock, to classical music, um, especially once I started studying with the principal percussionist in Buffalo. Um, that was really when I, I had a lot of access to classical music at that point. Um, but like uh, all the members of my family have really supported that and, and really kind of been happy for what I've been able to achieve and, and, and really embraced um, what I decided I wanted to do and kind of got behind me, which was um, very helpful. It's, it's, it's hard to do this alone. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stress and, and it's, and it's hard winning an audition. So um, having family support uh, was, was really instrumental in, in getting me here. We're glad they supported you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you, you know, a lot of us talk about um, breaking kind of the barriers down between mm -hmm. preconceived notions about classical music and yeah. you, would, you seem to be a, someone who embraces all these genres, what would you say if you were encouraging people to try classical music? And I think most people who are watching it today live have mm -hmm. already been coming to our concert, but this will go on Symphony Stream. What would you say in terms of why you would be compelled to hear the San Diego Symphony? Someone that isn't so familiar. Well, I think um, kind of the diverse programming that we do is a really um, really good way to reach people that, that maybe wouldn't know to come and see you know, Brahms 4, but they would go and see us play Harry Potter, which I think playing the, the movie scores, which, you know, hopefully that'll be able to happen again sooner rather than later. Um, but being able to do things like that and play these, um, the Pops concerts that we do over the summer, um, just to kind of see that well you know the orchestra and classical music is not just you know beethoven and brahms and mozart and and kind of these big composers that you maybe learn about in school but um don't appeal to everybody um i think reaching classical music from other other avenues such as you know film scores or pops concerts or um new music especially now like maybe coming to see like that Mason Bates piece that we did had some digital playback. Um, and, and I think the kind of the blending of, of genres that we do here um, 
on certain concerts is is not um, kind of this uptight, you know, posh world that classical music can be can be viewed as. Um, and also, I mean, getting to know some of the musicians as as people, like we're all, I mean, kind of being able to see us as members of the community and as not just kind of part of this large sound, um, you know, wearing very fancy clothes. Um, I think like the, the people that I know that come, that, that I bring to the symphony, um, having that personal connection makes it feel um, a little less disconnected and a little less like I'm in a totally different world than them. They're like, oh, well, I know somebody in there and they like, they're a real person and they like to cook and they like to, you know, have a nice bottle of wine with dinner. And, and they, once you know a little bit about the people in the symphony, I think it, uh, you're just kind of seeing the people that, that you care about and the people in a community that you care about that, um, kind of doing what we do and making beautiful music. And I think it adds a level of connection to what's happening on stage. Very much so. So um, before we go to the closing piece, um, mm -hmm. one more question about Marimba. In fact, actually, yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to change the subject slightly and then we'll go mm -hmm. to the leading right into the last piece. But um, tomorrow night, we're starting a new series called Listen Here as in H-E-A-R, uh, and it is uh, an opportunity for Rafael Payare and members of the orchestra and uh, Jared McBurney, who works with us um, as, as creative consultant to explore a piece of music in a, in a platform that's YouTube-based, Facebook page, open to the public. It starts at seven o'clock tomorrow. Um, and we're looking at Beethoven Ninth Symphony uh, as the first. It'll be Beethoven Nine, Eroica, and uh, I think Beethoven six. So we talked a little bit about Beethoven, but um, mm -hmm. percussion is present, but certainly not to the extent of Shostakovich in Beethoven's right. symphonies. Mm -hmm. um, I think Beethoven is one of those composers that I had to work a little bit harder to gain an appreciation for um, because it wasn't, as a percussionist, it wasn't something I was learning right away. Um, and I think once I started learning some timpani, um, which I don't get to do with the symphony, but um, I, I am okay with that. Um, I really gained an appreciation for Beethoven's writing and Beethoven's timpani writing and, and just like the way his symphonies are crafted is just so meticulous and impeccable. Um, and actually Beethoven 9 is, is one of the earliest uses of percussion in, in our classical repertoire, um, actually taken from the, originally from the Turkish Janissary bands, right. um, that, that sound like that kind of, that triangle symbols, bass drum sound, um, mm -hmm. kind of like a triumphant march at the end. Yeah, it, um, it, it leads the way to the next, to the next composer starting to use percussion. It does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and actually, well, Beethoven Beethoven Six is off, is also one of my favorite Beethoven symphonies, um, partially because that was uh, it was in Fantasia, which was once again my favorite movie as a kid. Um, but I just think like that that symphony is just so peaceful and so nice sounding, and and it's very relaxing, and I think I like that about it. Plus the timpani gets to be the thunder. It does. It does. It has a little bit to do. So, <laughs> so I encourage all of you to tune in tomorrow night um, and uh, as well. But one last question about marimba. Yeah. Um, I started with saying how beautifully you played those chords. And a number of people mm -hmm. have asked, um, how, how, how do the mallets work on the marimba? How, how do you create those from a physicality point of view? Um, so I, I do not make them myself. Um, there are a number of companies that make um, yarn mallets for marimba. And, and what a lot of them are is it's like a, it's a birch shaft. Um, actually, hang on. I can grab one real quick. So it's a, it's a birch shaft. And then on the top, 
it's attached underneath this yarn. Um, there is a core. Uh, sometimes it's hard rubber, sometimes it's plastic. Um, and different cores will give you a different weight and a different sound and a different kind of like strength of attack on the on the marimba. And then it's wrapped either like a little bit with yarn or a lot of it with yarn um, to make like harder mallets and softer mallets. And really the, the different colors help us know what hardness they are. Um, the ones I was using like the, the kind of reddish brown one on the, on the far low end of the marimba is the softest mallet. Uh, and this one was the hardest. Um, so you can use that, uh, what's called a graduated set of mallets to kind of help the upper notes speak a little bit better because they don't ring as long as the lower notes. Um, and conversely on the lower notes, you want a little bit of a softer mallet, a little bit of a heavier mallet to bring out um, to help the bar ring more. Um, and then that creates the sound by the, the resonating of the bar actually goes down into those large pipes underneath, which are called resonators. Um, and that helps the sound kind of blossom and, and makes it sound as full as it does. So there's a lot of physics involved in the marimba, as there are and with what, any. And the acoustic of the room itself, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was pleasantly surprised with the acoustic in my in my studio here. Uh, it's it's not nearly as good as being able to play in a hall or actually a church. I found is the most beautiful place to play marimba because there are very few uh, carpets or soft surfaces. So everything just rings forever, and it's kind of like playing in one big resonator. So I've always enjoyed that. Aaron, thank you so much for being with yeah, us. Yeah, of course. Today. It's always great. We've had the opportunity also as a just a few weeks ago to have a conversation with a special friend and you're mm -hmm. a, a wonderful musician and a great citizen of the orchestra. So thank you. Well, thank you. For being here today. It's always a yeah, pleasure. Yeah, happy to be here. This was a lot of fun. And Jen, we're going to turn it back to you for the closing and a little more Bach. Yeah. Thank you, Martha, for that insightful conversation. And Aaron, as you said, um, personal connection is a way to help break down kind of the stigma around attending the symphony. So thank you for taking time to give us that personal connection while we're away from the hall. Um, and thank you to all at home, not only for tuning in, but for supporting the San Diego Symphony. Uh, we can't do it without you and we miss you. Uh, you will receive a follow-up email with a recording of this episode, as well as a registration link for next week, where we will feature San Diego Symphony Orchestra violinist, Jean Yan Bocott. And uh, again, just to um, say again that like Martha said, we have our new program tomorrow night called Listen Here. And if you go to the symphony stream where you have access to lots of uh, audio recordings and podcasts, you'll see a link so that you can tune in live um, for our new program. We just, we're constantly thinking about different ways that we can continue to engage with you virtually. So we're glad that we can present these to you. Um, I hope you enjoyed your lunch. With that, we're going to share one more piece with you, and we will see you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.